Let's open up with prayer today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this time that we can come here. We can we can worship you. We can fellowship with our uh, friends and with our family in Christ. God, we pray for uh, the rest of this service, God, as we crack into your word, Lord, that you would reveal it to us, that you would guide us and lead us to the things that you would have us know, Lord, that these would be your words, not ours, God. And Lord, as we go into a time of fellowship after service, that you would bless that. You would use it to uh, edify us both physically, spiritually, and emotionally, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Crossing, how are you guys doing? Some of y'all obviously did not get the coffee that reopened today. I tell you what, I, I told them the other day, I said, we got to get the coffee back. They said, why? I said, because the Holy Spirit is not welcome until about 80 milligrams of caffeine has entered my body. So uh, we got it working today, though. Man, I'm glad to see you all here today. Um, I got a question for you, though. How many of you guys have been doing a seemingly easy and mundane task and just have it go all to pieces before in your life? Let me see. Show of hands. Show of hands. Some of y'all are way more coordinated or just way less honest than the rest of us, right? And uh, so last night I was going out and we were getting the grills for the meet and greet. By the way, y'all should come. They're going to be some good Jesus burgers, right? And uh, because last night we're going to get these grills and I'd gone over to my friend's house uh, is one of my best buddies and he has had three heart attacks by the age of 35. So he just recovered from his third one. I'm over there. We're eating and, you know, all healthy stuff. You know, you had a healthy kick and we planned on spending about an hour there. Four hours later, I'm like, hey, I got to go get the grills for the cookout tomorrow. We'll have a bunch of hungry, angry Christians hanging out afterwards. Not the whole goal of the day, right? So I go and I get the grills from my dad. I got his truck and his trailer. We load everything up. It's easy, right? And I'm driving down the road, and it's like a, a bundle of pots and pans mixed with boulders sliding down a mountain. And that's what I hear all of a sudden. I'm like, what in the heck is this? And I look in my back window in the truck and the, the, if this is the bottom of the trailer, it's about that high off the ground and at about that angle, right? So I'm like, hey, something here is not supposed to be happening, right? So we pull over, I call my dad and I'm thinking, man, I broke my dad's truck. Like just, just the thing I needed to do. But hey, guess what? I got good news. It wasn't me. It was my dad. Right? And so the, the actual trailer hitch to the truck dis like assembled itself. You know, I was like, Autobots assemble. Well, this was the exact opposite. It came apart and fell off. But luckily, the grills are okay. The food will go on today. But at 11 o'clock last night, me, Heidi, Izzy, Loki, which is my dog, uh, myself and my father are on the side of a relatively busy road, flashers, and there's a whole bunch of people going by being like, what in the world is wrong with them? Sometimes life throws you a curveball that you're just not expecting. You think, hey, I've got it together today. Today's going to be a great day. All I've got to do is get up, be an adult, go to work, come home, and not screw anything up. And about five minutes into the day, you realize, oh, Lord, it's going to be a rough one. How many of y'all had days like that before? How many of y'all feel like this has been a year like that, right? Like, it just seems like this year, every day you wake up, it's like a lottery. And you're like, okay, what's it going to be today? Like, I, I saw a news thing the other day. It said sandstorms, right, all coming across. And one of the posts my friends put, he's like, it's the mummy returns. Yeah. Remember those movies? I was like, bro, not this year, man. Like, come on, that's the last thing we need. The mummy returns. But as we keep going forward in our series talking about how we resolutely follow after Christ, today we're dealing with how do we have determination in the days of the docile. So we started off this series talking about how do we have peace in the midst of turmoil, with everything going on today, with everything happening in the world, how can I find some peace, some, some time that I can sit there and just be still and know that he is God? And how can I let that 
filter into my life, into my family's lives, into the people's lives around me. And then the next week we talked about grace in the midst of chaos. How everybody around us is seemingly going off the deep end. There's so much anger. There's so much hatred. There's so much arguing back and forth on so many different things. How do we, as a church, show grace in the midst of chaos? And then last week we talked about how do we be courageous in the face of fear for Father's Day. We talked about how we have an opportunity right now to take that peace, to take that grace that God has given us and spread it to the world, to take those tools and those those things that he's, the gifts and the blessings that he gives us and show the rest of the world how they too can receive that. And this week we're talking about determination. How do we set our eyes upon Christ and follow after him day in and day out? Because for every action, there is an equal and opposite Reaction, And in the age of the outraged people, there's just as many folks who are yelling and screaming as there are people who are going underground, who are saying, I'm just not going to deal with the problems and the things that are happening around me. I just can't do it. Or I, I don't have the energy for that today. How many of you guys have seen an argument before and said, nope, that's just not me. It's not worth it. I just can't do it. I can't do it today. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. My stress level is too high. Whatever that is. And there are a lot of people right now, understandably so, who have gone from the outrage and done the exact opposite, which is bury themselves underground. They are hiding from the issues. They are hiding from the people that need that assistance, that need that help. And what we're talking about today is how do we find that balance? How did Christ do it? How do, I, how do I stand up and fight for what is right while having peace? How do, I, how do I deal with social injustice? And how do I tell people what God has told me to do, but in a graceful way? And it seems like an oxymoron. It seems like we're being pulled in a bunch of different directions. But if, if I'm honest with you guys, I've got a confession to make today. I'm not exactly sure how to make all those things work in your life. You say, well, Josh, how do I deal with all the nuances, all the, the different struggles that I have, these, all these different conversations, the Facebook posts, the, the Twitter posts, the news stories, the, the friendships that are being severed. How do I deal with all of that and still keep all of these things at the front of my mind? I don't really know. We can try. I can point you in the right direction. But as a person, I, I feel a little like we, we get up here and we let you guys down a little bit almost. You know, four months on the job and I'm already coming up empty. In my defense, those four months have been a, well, I mean, look outside. You can roast a hot dog and not even start another fire, right? I mean, it's been a crazy four months, but you feel like there's something you're supposed to get up here and give wisdom and spread God's knowledge. And then when, when I'm asked myself these questions this week, like, how do I tell these people to do this stuff day in and day out? And I'm like, bro, how do I do it day in and day out? How do you, how do you make that happen? And so what's the point of me telling you this? What's the point of this confession? First, I don't want to get up here and have you guys think that I have all the answers? Because I don't. I don't. Half the time, recently, I feel like I don't even know which way I'm walking. You get up and you go and you do the best you can. But the second thing is this. Just because we don't know, doesn't mean we don't know a guy who does. Just because I can't tell you exactly how to do these things, doesn't mean that I don't know the guy who can't. And we say, hey, Josh, how do I do this? And I say, I don't know, but I know a guy. And you look at your lives and you say, but what happens when I mess up? And we say, we don't know, but we know a guy. And you say, how do I live out these different 
things in my life and how do I move forward being the change that I tell people they need to be? And I say, we don't know, but we know the guy who does. We know a guy who came and he lived and he died and he rose again to pay for our sins and who left a really good set of instructions to guide us in the right direction. And the third reason why I tell you that is to say this. This is a journey that we are on together. This is not something that the staff or the volunteers or the elders alone are saying, hey, this is what we're doing. This is a church-wide journey. For those of us who are here in person and for those of us who are watching live stream, we've got so many folks right now, but we're not individual units. We are one family together. And so my encouragement for you today as we crack into Scripture, as we come to God's Word and He gives us some advice that is, frankly, quite difficult to carry out, but maybe simple in the idea and the thought process, I encourage you to join together, to find a small group, to find a Bible study, to find friendships, to build community because it is always better to move forward in a group than it is to be alone. And so we're going to start today by reading in our main passage, which is found in Matthew 25, chapter 14 through 30. We're going to go through all of that, and we're going to extrapolate three points from this text as we move forward. And it goes like this. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, and to another, two bags of gold, and to another, one bag of gold, each according to his ability. Then he went away on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. And here's what we want to focus on today. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, and this is the interesting part right here, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. Here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken away from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think it is a bit of an understatement to say that Christ looks down upon passivity, that he looks down upon indecision just a little bit. And there's a couple things we learn from this passage that we want to kind of dive into today, but I'm not going to focus on the normal stuff. Normally, when we go through this passage, we focus on the two guys that got a lot, because we always like seeing the good stories, right? And I say, hey, Doug, guess what? You got five bags of gold? Now we got ten. Woohoo, brother. We good. 
right? We look at somebody else and they say, Josh, you had two bags of gold, now you got four. And I say, hey, I can finally afford to buy Heidi all the clothes she wants. We're good. We always want to talk about, is she in here? Don't tell her, oh, oh, crap. I love you. I'm going to hide behind my table now. We always want to talk about the good stuff. But we never want to focus on the warnings. We always want to do the health, wealth, and prosperity. Look at what happened to the servants with so much gold. They got so much more. By the way, it's not really talking about physical gold here. That's not the only thing it's mentioning. But that's what we want to focus on. Because everybody likes money. I used to think when I was growing up that money wouldn't be that important to me. And then I remember working my first job. I was 11 years old and my first $100 bill. How many of you guys remember your first $100 bill? Keith got his first $100 bill so long ago, he doesn't even know what it looked like. Did they even have $100 bills back then? (laughs) Keith's over there, by the way. I'm picking on him. Hey, Keith. Love you, buddy. But so what happens is when you get that, you think, oh, money's not important. I'm looking at that bill saying, I'm going to buy. Back then, I don't know what I bought with it. I think I bought a samurai sword. But as time goes on, our priorities change. And so the first thing we see here is passivity is a plague. Passivity is a plague. There are two main reasons why the servant did not do anything for his his God, for his master. And the first one is that he was paralyzed with fear. It says it in here that I was afraid because I knew you were a hard man reaping where you do not sow and, and, and picking up seeds that you didn't spread. Like I knew you, you go, you get it, you do it. You, I think the term today is you grind, right? He grinds, he gets out there and he does it. He makes bread. Is that still a term? Like it makes bread? I'm looking at the young folks right here. Is, is that it? No, I'm behind times. So I'm sorry, guys. But you go out and he does it. But the master looks at him and says, well, that's not the only reason why. The other reason is not only were you afraid, but you were lazy. Because all it would have taken to get that return is to put it on loan with the bankers and to get at least something. Proverbs 18.9 reinforces this. It says, one who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. Sometimes we tell ourselves we're too fatigued to act, that none, it's none of our business. How many times we thought that? Oh, it's none of my business. I'm not going to deal with that. Sometimes we tell ourselves that there's no point to trying, that we can't change anything, so why even worry about it? But often... Passivity is a chosen way of life, and the hope is that we avoid danger or evil or just trouble in in general. But in reality, we have to realize that by doing nothing, we are allowing the other things to happen. The argument could be made that passivity is the downfall of mankind. One of the original things, you ever looked at the story of Adam and Eve? Everybody likes to blame Eve a whole bunch, right? You guys ever notice that? I've heard probably 500 sermons on Adam and Eve. Well, guess who gets blamed? It's always Eve. Poor Adam. Oh, his wife. Hell, brother, let me tell you, women these days. I actually heard a pastor preach that, the evil of women based on Adam and Eve. And I saw his wife up there, and the only thing I could think of was like, man, she is going to hit him with her purse After this message, right? But it was was all about Eve and everything evil that she did and how horrible it was when really Adam was right there. We we, we don't want to talk about that, do we, guys? It's like somebody says, oh, my wife bought shoes again. You were in the store with her, right? You were there. You were right there. And they say, oh, look at what they did. Well, that's, it's your house too. Like it's it's an equal opportunity partnership here. But we want to focus on one or the other. And so you say, well, Adam didn't have a choice. Well, no, Adam could have said no. Adam could have stepped up and said, hey, this is an attack on our family. This is an attack on our God. But Adam chose to do nothing. 
And I wonder sometimes if maybe we don't, as Christians, fall into that trap of saying, you know what, I really, I don't want to argue today. I'm going to pick my battles. Maybe I'm just going to leave this one alone. Or maybe, you know, I just, today's not the day. I don't feel all that great. I'm a little tired. I didn't get all my beauty sleep last night, so I'm having a bad hair day. My makeup's messed up. That's always a problem for me. <laughs> like three people got it. But sometimes we have to take that stand and say, today is the day that I will stand for what is right. Today is the day, based on the peace that I have, delivered with the grace that God gave me, I'm not going to let this injustice ride. I'm going to let them know what God has told me. I'm going to stand up for what is right. I'm going to meet those needs that I see instead of just talking about them. That is one of my least favorite things Christians do. How many of you guys have ever heard somebody talk about the, the, the horrors of abortion? But then they never give a reason, like a way to, to go forward. Oh, it's just so horrible. Everybody's going to burn in hell. But there's never a path forward. We're real quick to, to picket it and protest it, but we're very slow to say, here is an answer. Here is something that we can do. We talk all the time about feeding the hungry, but how many times do we actually take food out of our cupboard and give it to the person who is hungry on the streets? We say all the time, oh, I'm going to help support this mission, but how often do we actually support the mission? Or if we see somebody who is in need, do we actually meet that need? You know, one of the least satisfying, most frustrating things that I've ever encountered in my life it is empty promises from Christians. When I was going through hard times and they said, oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm going to pray for you. I don't want you just to pray for me. You want somebody to help you. Sometimes in life, there are opportunities for us to step up and do something and it's risky, but we have to take that risk. It may push us out of our comfort zone, but we have to step forward. Otherwise, what good is the grace that we have? What good is this news that I carry inside of me that can change the world if I don't actually do anything with it? If I don't actually go out and say, today, I'm going to meet the need of those around me. The second thing is this, whatever is not an answer. You know, fatalism teaches us that there is this blind, impersonal, giant force that controls the, the world and the, and the universe that we live in. And no one has a hope to control it, not even God. And nothing that we do, the events that we have happen in our lives are swept along by this force and we cannot change it at all. And a belief like fatalism allows us just to say, what happens? It happens. Hey, what happened happened, man. Or have you ever heard the term, it is what it is. I used to have a boxing buddy. He was British. He would go, it is what it is, man. It is what it is. But the problem with that mindset is it is attractive because if it's not in my power to do something about it, then I can sit here and warm this seat all day long. If there is no use, if there is no help, for the things that happen to me, if me losing five jobs isn't actually my fault, why do I need to change? If me going through three marriages isn't my fault, why do I need to do anything? If me causing chaos, if, the, if my friends are running away, if my jobs are leaving me, if my family's disowning me and I say it's all their fault, why do I need to change? And that's the allure of a mindset. Like that. And the servant that we see here fell into this also because as much as he could say he was paralyzed by fear, all he had to do, and the master points this out, was to just put it on deposit on the bank. Just had to do something. But if in our minds, what we do doesn't make a difference anyways, what does it matter? Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. 
People often say they can't change anything, but if you look at history, who is the driving force of all the changes ever in our world? It's not a bunch of computers. It's not Mickey Mouse. It's not TV. It's not cars. The the things that changed, changed because people got behind it and did stuff. People put themselves out there and moved forward. The other two servants were blessed not because they were lucky to get the gold. They were blessed because they worked hard to invest the talents that were given to them, not the other way around. And we have to understand that as we move forward as Christians, we need to keep the same mentality because there is value in determination. And that's our third point. There is value in determination. The biblical model of this is repeated time and time again. God's will is accomplished by ordinary believers with extraordinary determination. Ordinary people that are willing to go to extraordinary lengths to complete God's will and receive magnificent blessings. You look at Noah, just a normal guy. You look at Abraham, Joseph, Moses. Moses was called to go speak to the Pharaoh and he had a stutter. He had a speech impediment. They said, hey, go preach to the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. And Moses was like, hey, God, by the way, I can't talk. But he did it anyways. The Bible heroes are known more for their determination than their giftedness. Service is not measured by your talent. It is not measured by how good you look while you are serving. It is measured by how much you serve and how hard you chase after your goal. You can serve just as well as anybody else greeting people at the front door. You can serve just as hard as anybody else cleaning up the church building afterwards. If you take your talents and your gifts, whatever those are, the things that you do well, and you put them to work for God, there is a value to that determination. You will find purpose. You will find peace. You can lay your head down at night knowing that I have done something for God that was within my reach. Maybe your giftedness is singing. We need to get on stage. Maybe your giftedness is preaching. I would love to help train another preacher here. Maybe your giftedness is teaching. We need to get you teaching, folks. Whatever that is, we need to make sure that we understand that there is only value in those talents if they are paired with the determination to move forward. All the peace and all the grace and all the courage in the world doesn't matter if I don't turn on the car. Got to go forward. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Don't run for second place. Don't run just to finish. Run in such a way to get the prize. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become wary in doing good for the proper time. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So why is determination so important to disciples today? Because God calls us to live in extraordinary ways. Unconditional love requires determination in the giver. Selfless service requires determination on a day-to-day -day basis. Unceasing prayer requires determination. Overcoming evil with good requires determination. Seeking first the kingdom, staying faithful, living your life for God, going against the flow, all of those things require determination. These are extraordinary elements of the disciples' life that Jesus calls us to live day in and day out. You know, we can talk a whole bunch about how all this bad stuff is happening, about how all these horrible things are going on day to day, and we want to acknowledge it. We want to let you guys know that we're here for you because we're feeling the same things that you guys are. 
But at the same time, if you look hard enough, there is a massive uprising from people all around the world, from all different walks of life, from different ethnicities to different economic statuses to different upbringings and backgrounds that are stepping up and saying, enough is enough. I'm going to stand for what is right. I'm going to be the good, be the change that I want to see in my community. I'm going to go out and be the service that I talk about wanting so often instead of just waiting for somebody else to do it. And so I thought I would talk about a couple of takeaways today that would maybe start us on the right track, that would maybe give us a good idea of where we can begin to go in our day-to-day lives as we try to apply these truths that we learn through Scripture because it can be a bit difficult. It can be a bit difficult. So the first takeaway is this. As we move forward and we go in there, Take note of the needs of others around you. Take note. So often we want to talk about those needs. We want to pray about those needs. We want to, you know, go about our day, but just kind of gently shove aside those needs. But we don't take time to actually acknowledge them. I can't tell you how many times in, in my life I've been on a mission, right? Right? I've been on a, a goal. I am, I'm going and I'm moving and somebody stops to talk to me about something that is going on and you have to shift gears. You have to be willing and open to take time to acknowledge the things that are going on around you. Otherwise, we will not be able to help. Take a moment. Slow down in the morning. Open yourself up through prayer and say, God, you know what? Today, make me sensitive to the needs of those around me. Help me to see not just the the cluster of things going on on TV, but the cluster of needs in my friends and family circle, the people who are hurting, the people who are broken, the people who are struggling day to day. Help me to see that. And when you start the day off focusing on that, with it off in the side of your head saying, hey, look for stuff, I guarantee you, you will see stuff all around you that you can help with. The second thing is this. Not only do we need to notice the needs of those, but we need to actually meet the needs we can deal with and then work on the problems that you can actually fix. If there's somebody who needs food and I've got a bag of food with me, give them the food. If there's somebody who needs financial assistance and I know a place that helps with that, direct them to that place. We can't just acknowledge the needs and then do nothing about it. We have to acknowledge what's going on and then do our part to be that solution. To say, hey... I'm going to step into this gap for somebody. And if you're blessed with finances, maybe it's finances that you help them with. If you're blessed with food, maybe it's food that you help them with. If you're blessed with compassion and and a caring attitude, maybe it's just somebody they can talk to and then you can direct them to a place. But do what you can. And then the third point is this. Once I've acknowledged those needs, once I've done what I can, it's okay to pass it forward. The things that I can't fix, don't worry about them. Do what you can for it and then push it into a situation that it can be fixed. Maybe that looks like marriage counseling. Maybe you know somebody or maybe it's you guys that are dealing with marital strife. And you come up and and you talk with a friend and they say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to listen to you talk. But these aren't issues that I can help you fix need to talk with a counselor. Maybe it's depression or or drugs or, or finances, whatever the issue is that you see around you. Take a moment, acknowledge it, do what you can for it, pray for them, offer what assistance that you can, but then make sure that if it is out of your control, if it is beyond your skill set, that you take it to somebody who can. We don't want to leave people behind. We don't want to leave people from our presence saying, 
well, what good was it to talk with Blake? You know, I spilled my heart to him. I told him all my issues, and he said, man, I love you, and then he just left. What, what did it happen? Blake would never do that, by the way. Blake would give you the shirt off his back. But we need to make sure that we are that change. And as we go into a time of invitation today, we thought we'd do it just a tiny bit different. If you'll notice here in the sanctuary, all along the walls, there are different poster boards with 20 or 30 different sticky notes on there. And I wanted to invite you guys to have an opportunity to start being that difference today. On those boards are sticky notes that you can take off and peel off one or two, and it's a subject. And I would encourage you and challenge you to pray over that every single day this week. Some of it is COVID-19 related sickness. Some of it is community needs. Some of it is for uh, racial tension. Some of it is for police officers. Some of it is for the church body as we move forward. But take one or two sticky notes and say every day this week, I'm going to start off my day by praying over this subject. It doesn't have to be for hours. It can be for a couple minutes. But then as you go through your day, look for ways that you can serve in that capacity. Look for ways that you can help ease those tensions. Look for ways that you can help bring some peace to somebody who's suffering from ramifications of COVID-19. Look for ways that you can be the grace and the peace that Christ gave us to the rest of